I'm deeply grateful to the Chief Rabbi, Rabbi Warren Goldstein, for having invited me to come to this tremendous kinos of Kiddush Shem Shemayim. I cannot thank him and the officers that are part of the Chief Rabbi's office, Rabbi Gidon Pagron, for his great help. And I will never forget the wonderful help of Tracy in the office, her organization, and her tending to every detail was absolutely marvelous. It is a great covet to be able to speak with such outstanding Torah personalities, great Jewish people of great accomplishment, and I hope that we'll be able to be inspired together. As the Jews gathered around Har Sinai, before they were able to get the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu says to all of them, Hishamru lachem, be careful, Alois Bahar, when you go up to the mountain, Unogeya Bukotseu, and you will touch not even the edge of the mountain. Moshe Rabbeinu warned Klau Yisrael that Har Sinai was so holy that one may not even touch the edge of the mountain. However, the Kotzka Rebbe once said that these words of Moshe Rabbeinu can be understood in a different meaning, in a different context. The Kotzka Rebbe once said that if somebody is trying to accomplish something, to achieve something major, he must know that he must climb the entire mountain. Be careful, Alois Bahar, when you're going up to the mountain, and you're only touching the edge. Don't touch the edge. Climb to the top of the mountain. Tonight, we have come to the mountain of Sinai and Daba. Tonight, we have begun to climb and we must reach the top of Mount Sinai and Daba. We cannot really and merely touch the edge. We have come to listen, to absorb, and to commit. I want to share with you two stories that I think will change your life forever. The first story happened a number of years ago in New York. There is a yeshiva called Derachayim, and one of the teachers there, one of their Magide Shir, is a man by the name of Rabbi Moshe Pluchak. And he told me that in the summer, the whole yeshiva moves up to the mountain area near Monticello in a place called Greenfield Park. And they have there what is known as a kolel mechanchim. A kolel mechanchim is a place of study for all the teachers that teach in the various camps in the mountains, in the boys' camps and in the girls' camps. All those that come to teach Torah, they come in this kolel mechanchim and the voice of Taira is absolutely incredible. They've been doing this for a number of years. And Rabbi Moshe Pluchak told me that a number of years ago, the first day he looked around, he recognized most everybody from previous years. But then he noticed the businessman. He never saw this fellow before. And he figured he probably came from a local bungalow colony. The man opened up his Gomorrah. And he started learning with a tremendous diligence. Rabbi Pluchak noticed the first day, the second day, he was really into the Gemara. And as Rabbi Goldstein said, when somebody has a kasha, that's such a great feeling. When he had a question on the Gemara, he would go to ask of the younger fellows. They were all younger than him. But at Tzachnid Geshem, he wasn't embarrassed. He would go and ask the question. Rabbi Pluchak told me he was so impressed with the diligence of this person and the Hasmada. He went over to him and he said, Shalom Aleichem, I never saw you here before. Who are you? I'm so impressed with your diligence in learning. You come in the morning and you stay throughout the afternoon. It's really incredible to watch you. And he said, Rabbi, you don't know me, but the art scroll Gemara is carrying me. He said, I never had an opportunity to learn when I was young. And now that Art Scroll has translated the Gemara, I'm able to come and I'm able to study and I'm able to learn. He says, Rabbi, you don't know, but I have liver cancer. And if I would concentrate on how sick I really am, I wouldn't make it through a day. So I come here 
and I take my Gemara and I throw myself into the learning and I try to maintain a connection to the legacy that is Klal Yisrael. Rabbi Pluchak told me he was so moved by this person. He said, listen, I want to become your friend. And I don't want you to have to go ask anybody any questions. Ask me. If I can give you the answer, I will. And if not, I will go and ask for you. But you stay right in your seat. Learn as much as you can. And if you got questions, come over to me. And they become very friendly throughout the summer. Next to the last day of the session, Rabbi Pluchak told me he comes in and he doesn't see this fellow. And his heart falls. Where is the guy? And he sees he's sitting in the back and he looks awful. And he goes over to him and he says, is everything okay? You don't look so good today. And the man says, Rabbi, my illness is progressing. And the last couple of days I've been thinking, what's the difference if I learn anyway? Who cares? You think I understand everything? Even when you explain it to me or the other fellows explain it to me, I understand most of it. You guys are big Tamir Chachamim. When you learn, it's special. What's the difference if I learn? And Rabbi Pluchak told me that it was a miracle that the night before on a Jewish radio station, he heard this magnificent story. Many years ago in the 1950s, there was a great symphony orchestra leader. His name was Arturo Toscanini. He was a brilliant musician. He was a perfectionist. He had an ear for orchestral detail. And he was an extremely intense person. He was known throughout the world. He led symphony orchestras all over the world. And near the end of his life, he had a biographer who was writing his story. And one afternoon, the biographer comes and he says, Master, I'd like to come tomorrow night. I'd like to be able to finish the book. I would like to interview you. He says, tomorrow night you can't come. He said, why not? He says, because tomorrow night I'm doing something so special. I don't want any interruptions whatsoever. He said, what are you doing? He said, there's a certain orchestra that I used to lead, but now because of my health, I can't lead it this year. And tomorrow night on shortwave radio, they're going to play that concert on the radio. I want to listen. I don't want any disruptions. I don't want anybody there. I just want to listen and see how the conductor leads that orchestra. He said, your honor, it would be so special for me if I could come and watch how you listen and listen together with you. I promise I won't say a word. He said, you promise you won't say a word? He said, not a word. Okay, you can come. A quarter to eight the next night, the writer comes into the house. Toscanini is sitting there and they put on the shortwave radio. Five to eight, eight o'clock, it starts exactly. By nine o'clock, the concert is over. Toscanini shuts off the radio, the shortwave radio, and the fellow goes over to him and he says, wasn't that magnificent? And Toscanini says, no, it wasn't. He says, what do you mean it was beautiful? He said, no, there were supposed to be 120 musicians there, 15 violinists. There were only 14 there. And the guy looks at him like he's crazy. How could he know over shortwave radio that one violinist was missing? But he didn't want to tell him that he thought he was crazy because otherwise he'd lose the job of writing the biography. But he decided he's going to call. He'll call the music director. The next day, he calls the music director in that country. He says, tell me, how many musicians were supposed to be there? And how many showed up? He said, it's easy. I'll look it up. He looks it up. He said, there were supposed to be 120 there, 15 violinists, and only 14 showed up. Well, now the guy couldn't believe it. He comes back to Toscanini, and he says to him, your honor, I must admit that last night, I, I thought that you were just being haughty. But just explain it to me. How in the world could you know of a shortwave radio that one violinist was missing, only 14 showed up, and the 15th wasn't there? Listen to what he said. It's going to change your life forever. Toscanini said, there's a great difference between me and you. You are the audience. And to you, everything sounds great. But I'm the conductor. And a conductor has to know every note of music that's going to come forth. When I began to listen intently... And I realized there were some notes not coming forth. I knew without a doubt that one of those violinists wasn't there. Said Rabbi Pluchak to this gentleman, maybe to me it doesn't make a difference that you're learning. But to the conductor of the World Symphony, 
who knows every line of Torah that can be learned, who knows every line of tefillah that can be prayed, to him it makes a difference because he knows what everyone can do. The man was so taken by that. He said, Rabbi Pluchak, how could I thank you? They embraced and the next day they parted. In the winter, Rabbi Pluchak met the son of this man and he says to him, how's your father? And the man says, Rabbi Pluchak, my father passed away. But I want to tell you something. Ever since he came home from the bungalow colony, every time he opened up the Gemara, he said, I'm performing for the conductor of the World Symphony. We are all musicians in Hashem's symphony. In the spiritual symphony of Hashem, we are all musicians. And in just like in every orchestra, the cellist can't play like the violinist, the violinist can't play like the flutist, and the flutist can't play like the drummer. And they don't have to play like each other. Each has to be the best that they can be. All of us here tonight, and every Jew around the world, is a musician in God's symphony. I don't have to be like you, you don't have to be like me, and both of us don't have to be like him. We each have to be the best that we can be. And that's what we come here tonight for. We come to Sani and Daba to learn how to be the best musicians that we can be, each according to his own level. To listen, to absorb, and to commit. I want to share with you one more story. In the 1940s, there was a rov in a town called Dobrish in Poland. The rov's name was Rabbi Mordechai Avigdor. Rachman al in 1940, he and his wife and his four children, two boys and two girls, were taken by the Nazis, Yemach Shemom, and they were taken from one ghetto to another ghetto, from one concentration camp to another concentration camp. One was worse than the other. In Nebuch, in July of 1944, Mrs. Avigdor, Mrs. Rechel Avigdor was taken out with a whole group of women, and they were all killed. And then a few days later, the Avigdor family, Rabbi Mordechai Avigdor and his children were taken on a train and they were taken to a big area and Rabbi Avigdor and his two boys were put in one place and the girls were put in a second place. And then they switched and they took Rabbi Avigdor with the girls. Of course, because he was elderly and the girls were weak and they knew what would be in store for them. And so Rabbi Avigdor tried with his two girls to go to the side where the two boys were because they knew the two boys were strong and they would probably be put to work camps, but at least they would have a chance for survival. They tried a few times to go, then they were beaten and pushed back. And so Rabbi Mordechai Avigdor, when he saw his older son Yitzchak, who was 24, with the younger brother Avram, who was only 15 at the time, he cried out to his son Yitzchak, he said, Yitzchak, make sure that you always keep your eyes on Avram. Never let him out of your sight. Make sure that you both survive together. And that was the last words they heard as a family. The boys were in Mottenhausen. They were there for a year. Worked to the bone. They became so frail and so thin and so pale. And then at the end, they were liberated. They came out. So many never had been killed. And they eventually ended up in Milan. Yitzchak was hoping together with Avram that they would be able to go from Milan, they would be able to go to Eretz Yisrael. And one day in Milan, there's a woman that comes and Yitzchak recognizes her. It's Pesha, the daughter of the Chazan of Dobrish. And he says, Pesha, what are you doing here? And she says, I'm looking for my husband. We were in the ghetto together and they took my husband and I was able to survive and I've been wondering for years waiting to see if I could find them. I'm going from camp to camp, from DP place to DP place, trying to find them. And Yitzchak was heartbroken because he knew that her husband had been killed. He saw Nebuch when he died and he had been killed and they let him out in the field. And he didn't know how in the world is he going to tell this terrible news to this girl who no longer has a husband. And he had to tell it to her slowly. And he told her, I have no choice, but I have to tell you that I saw that your husband is no longer alive. And she started crying and screaming. And she said, my life is over. My life is over. I'm finished. I'll never remarry. He was the one that I loved. I've been looking for him for years. And now I know it's over. It's terrible. She was about to leave. And he told her, stay overnight. 
She stayed overnight, and the next day when she was about to leave, she says, here, let me give you a letter that I saw that your husband died. Because everybody's trying to remarry. And if you don't have a letter that somebody saw that your husband died, you'll be considered an aguna. You won't be able to remarry. She says, I'm never going to remarry. Don't give me the letter. I don't care. I don't need it. My life is over. He says, don't be silly. Please take the letter. She didn't want to take it. He wrote it anyway, and he stuffed it into her purse. She left, and she came to Bergen-Belsen. She was in Bergen-Belsen for a few weeks. And then eventually she met a young man. And somehow her life began to change. And she was thinking maybe she should get married to this fellow. He was interested in her. But now she knew that in Bergen-Belsen they were up on him there. And nobody could get married without permission of the Rav. They had to have some proof. So she's on a long line and she's waiting and she's so impatient. And finally she comes to the Rav. And she says, I want to get married. He says, were you married before? She says, yes. He says, do you have proof? He says, yes, I saw somebody told me that my husband died. He said, yeah, but what proof do you have? She said, well, I, she takes out of a purse, she takes out a letter. And he says, but this is not an official letter. It's, you know, I can't, I can't judge on this. And she says, but I saw this man. I just saw him in Milan. And she throws down the letter. And Rabbi Afinkter sees the letter from his own son. And he says, you saw this man? He's alive? She said, yeah, I just saw him a few weeks ago. He says, that's my son. I had no idea that he's alive. Where is he? And she says, he's in Milan. And right afterwards, he goes and he calls Rabbi Yaakov Griffel, who was head of the Jewish Rescue Committee in Milan. And he says, tell me, is it true that my boy survived? And Rabbi Griffel calls him back a few days later. He says, yeah, they're here. He says, tell them that I'm going to come for them. I want to meet them. And it took three months until he was able to get out of Bergen-Belsen. And he makes up with Rabbi Griffel that the boys will meet him in the Milan train station. And he comes to the Milan train station. And there are thousands of Italian soldiers. Oh, it's such a mahal, it's such a tumult. And the father's looking for the sons and the sons are looking for the father. They had passed each other numerous times, but they didn't recognize each other. Because they were all both so frail and they looked so different and thin. And finally the father yelled, Yitzchok, Avraham, where are you, my children? And then the children, they heard the voice of the father, and they ran towards the father, and they embraced, and they were reunited. Many years ago at Har Sinai, our father in heaven gave us a gift. He gave us the greatest gift of all. He gave us the Torah. But over the years, Klal Yisrael has distanced themselves. They've fallen far away from Hashem. Hashem is calling to his children, all the children here inside of Hindaba, he's calling to the children, come close to me. And we come here because we want to come close to Hashem. Our father is looking for us and we are looking for him. That's the purpose of Sani and Daba. The purpose is just as Hashem was close to us at Sinai, he wants to become close to us here at the Mount Sinai and Daba. And that's the purpose of coming, to listen, to absorb, and to commit. If we only take these days seriously, and we listen to every person, and we try to grow, and we try to reach the top of the mountain. And that's Chus. Hashem will become so close to us and bring us to the ultimate mountain. He will send his emissary Mashiach to bring us to Hartsia in Yerushalayim with Mashiach Tzidkenu B'mherov Yameinu. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for listening. <laughs>